you everyone for being here. I've had a great time, got a lot of great feedback from lots of you. Uh, before we have our afternoon speaker, we, I'd like to introduce next year's chair, uh, Ms. Chris Fade from South Carolina, and she has a couple words to encourage you to come to the next meeting. Website. If you please go there and follow the instructions so that we can e -pub publish the material from here, that'd be great. Um, so now I'd like to introduce you to the speaker who I've gotten to know a little bit. And in a little bit of backstory, I spent some time yesterday with Michelle Quaid, and I asked her one of her biggest challenges, what she's working on now. And Eric Schmidt actually testified in front of uh, Congress, and he said, High tech is 3x ahead of reg regular industry, and regular industry is 3x ahead of. Um, you know, academia and government. So one of her bigger projects that she's actually working on is closing that 9x gap, which is not, academia and government is 9x behind what high tech is. And it actually feeds into our next speaker because he is a high tech student. And the best way I can tell you about him is he's a high tech mechanical engineer dropout. He dropped out of college because he wanted it to advance himself in his business more than he could get at college from a technology standpoint. And he's been very, very successful with his business. And he's a very mature, driven young man, extremely mature. Last night he was talking about, at 21 years old, he was talking about financial stability and he was drinking old fashions. So a little bit ahead of his time at this point. But he's, uh, he did go to Vanderbilt for a couple years. His company is called Ecoviate. I get it right for once? <laughs> Awesome, Ecovia, and he, it's been a very successful company. He's a Forbes magazine, 30 under 30, and it's all based on technology. He has several patterns in the field and clean technology, and, how he, and he'll tell you more about it. Um, and he also has a lot of brilliant ideas. He's, as you get to know him, he's a very driven man, and he's very smart, and after he's done speaking, he'll stick around for questions, and we might have some time to ask him some questions about, you know, I'm actually interested, why, why did you drop out? What was missing in academia that cho you chose to go in a different route? 
And so it's kind of a full cycle of the technology from someone at a very large company to someone with a startup and a an serial entrepreneur as he's becoming. And you all can say you knew him when. So if you please welcome Param Jaggi to the stage. Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, yeah, so just to be upfront, um, I, I was told right before I got on stage that about 75% of the room is uh, college educated. So uh, as Kevin alluded to, um, I dropped out of college, so go easy on me. Um, so uh, when I was trying to figure out what exactly I was going to talk about, um, you know, all my research has been in the environmental sustainability field. Um, and I took some inspiration from one of my heroes, uh, Bill Nye. Um, I don't know if you guys um, have seen him, Bill Nye, the science guy. Um, and I was watching one of his speeches, and what he said was, and it's very powerful, that, um, that there's more stars in the sky than grains of sand on Earth, right? And which means that there's nearly an infinite number of stars in our galaxy. Um, and the assumption is that there's nearly an infinite number of galaxies in our universe. Um, and it hasn't been proven yet, but there's probably um, an infinite number of universes in everything we call the world life. And if you think about that at such a grand scale, um, it really makes you feel, as an individual, very insignificant. Uh, we're just this minute detail um, in everything that we call life. Uh, but then what Bill Nye says is that, you know, with our brain, with something that is the size of two of our fists put together, um, something this big, we're able to conceptualize um, all of this that we call the universe, the world. Um, and something this small is able to take us from one side of the cosmos to the other and back again. Um, and it gives us the ability to build and to create and to empathize, to feel, to think, um, and to empower others along the way. Um, and so I, what I really see is that you know, this ability to um, kind of conceptualize the world around us and build the world around us as a superpower. Um, and so that's why I named the talk Superpowers and Sustainability. So usually when uh, someone talks about the environmental field or something related to sustainability, it's, uh, it's usually focused around you know, something like Peter the polar bear here. Um, and you say something really depressing about um, what's going on in the world and uh, the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and uh, how we're pretty much screwed. Um, but I'm going to try to keep things a little more positive and kind of uh, see it as an opportunity to uh, overcome these obstacles. So my story started when I was uh, very, very young. Um, I was always, uh, I guess, a nerd. I, uh, um, I always carried around a screwdriver in my pocket. I was always interested and very curious about the world around me. Um, and things like science and technology and physics and chemistry really fascinated me. Um, and you know, while other kids were going after girls and trying to shoot, um, shoot a basketball, you know, I was more interested in uh, building my lab in my bedroom and uh, more interested in biofuels and algae growth. Um, and so, I mean, one day I went to my parents and said that, you know, I want to I wanna build a lab in my room because I feel like it's inefficient that I have to get up in the morning and then walk down the street to my school to start, start my lab work. Um, so I ended up taking that, those materials and moving it directly in my bedroom, um, sleeping on one side and building things on the other. Um, and I guess as time went on, I, um, I did a lot of research projects, I um, built a lot of things for the environment, um, was really curious about the world around me. Um, started traveling the world and kind of presenting my ideas to professors, to people in the industry. Um, and what I really realized was that, you know, even as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, and throughout my teenage years, that um, even at that such a young age, you have the ability to kind of impact and um, kind of create the future and, um, and solve some of the world's biggest problems. And that was really when I realized that, you know, everything that we're building and creating and, you know, technology in general is a superpower. Um, and so I kind of want to go into like a few of these generic superpowers, and I'm going to try not to go into too much uh, jargon and uh, um, technical talk. But um, so I'm, one of the most baseline things is things like data science, um, computer science, um, the ability to control computers. Um, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating what like what that ability has given us as a um, um, has given mankind to do. Um, another one, rapid rapid prototyping, manufacturing. Um, understanding you know, chemical processes and then applying that towards um, you know, a wide variety of facets. Um, and then everyone's favorite, robots, artificial t intelligence, um, kind of programming these computers to think like a human um, and advance our society forward. 
um, and the last, genetic engineering, being able to control and kind of feed the world. Um, you know, each one of these is uh, kind of in a different field, but it, um, you know, if, if you were to go back 100, 200, 300 years and kind of show them these technologies, they would think you were a god. You were, um, you were kind of a Superman character that has these, uh, um, these superpowers. Um, but I guess now we're kind of at a crossroads of, you know, we have these superpowers, these technical talents, um, but we have to figure out what we're going to do with them. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'm sure you guys know of Homer Simpson. Um, and so we're kind of at the crossroad where we have an angel and the devil on one side where, um, you know, we, we have two options in front of us. Either we can invent the next Facebook for dogs or we can use these abilities to solve the biggest problems our society faces. Um, and so the assumption I'm making is that, you know, we should apply these, these superpowers towards solving things like poverty and sustainability, um, climate change, and so on. So I, I've been saying a lot about, I've been t saying the word sustainability a lot, and I think it's important to define exactly what that means. Um, I think it's, uh, it's been an overused and a kind of a jargon terminology. So uh, when I was preparing the talk, I d did what every other millennial does. I went to Google first to kind of figure out the exact definition of what it means to be sustainable. So I went to Google, and Google says that sustainability is the uh, property to, of being sustainable. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I know that the last speaker, or the last keynote, was uh, uh, the CTO at Google. So um, I wanted to ask her about that one. But um, so I, I started thinking about you know, what does sustainability actually mean um, as it relates to both the environment, us as humans, and to the planet. Um, and it really can be divided into these th three Ps, um, divided into achieving success in people, planet, and profit. So every action you take, everything you build, everything you ship, um, making sure that you're focusing on um, all three areas, advancing mankind with people, um, giving people, um, you know, serving some sort of demand, um, addressing the uh, planet. So making sure that uh, the materials you're using, the, the processes, the services that you're providing um, are not harming the planet um, more than, more than what it was when you were going into it. Um, and then also creating a profit and creating a sustainable um, kind of a sustainable business model and a um, sustainable company. Um, and then I mean, you can go into the quantitative numbers of kind of how sustainability is divided and um, you know, where our carbon emissions are coming from. Um, but I think the really the, the key point, and uh, I'm going to talk about a few really cool technologies that are um, kind of being applied in every single one of these facets. But you know, if you look at the breakdown, um, this is provided by the EPA of, of uh, where carbon emissions are coming from in the United States. Um, so, I mean, there's a big chunk that's coming from electricity generation, um, another big chunk coming from transportation and industry. Um, but then, you know, if you actually look into, if you look deeper into each one of these categories, um, a lot of it's actually coming down to electricity. Um, so it's electricity generation on one hand and then the usage of electricity um, in, in other fields. And as things like electric vehicles take off more, um, I mean, it's going to be vital to apply these kind of the superpowers, these uh, um, technical talents we have and apply them towards um, um, kind of making this, uh, well, the, the pie chart is relative, but um, decrease the overall amount of carbon emissions. So uh, scientists recently said that carbon emissions in the atmosphere passed 400 parts per million. Um, and if you look back, in, uh, back to history and science papers, um, they, they said that, you know, the second we cross 300 parts per million, we're going to be screwed. Um, the second we cross 350 parts per million, um, there's no turning back. Um, so recently, I mean, we crossed 400 parts per million, and I mean, the way I see it is that, you know, and they say that there's no, there's no way we can return back to, back to where we were. But you know, going with the whole superhero mentality. Um, so imagine we, as society, as humans, we're Batman, right? And uh, the Joker or Bane is uh, carbon emissions and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, you know, the carbon dioxide, Joker, and Bane have taken over Gotham, right? Um, and there's probably no return to the original Gotham City. Um, but as, as us, Batman, um, what do we do? Are we, are we going to sit back and just let it happen, or are we going to fight to the very end and kind of hope that all of Gotham comes together um, to solve these problems? Um, and so, I mean, when you're looking at it, there's both direct and then indirect solutions towards climate change. Um, you know, and, and it's exactly what it, what it means that you know, you're either directly reducing carbon emissions in the atmosphere um, related to sustainability, or you're indirectly, you're you know, running some sort of business that is indirectly making the world a better place. Um, and the best, I mean, one of the best examples I can give for indirect um, uses of superpowers and sustainability is uh, the company Uber. I mean, like what Uber has done with uh, 
with a ride sharing and um, kind of reducing carbon emissions in the transportation space. I mean, they built a multi-billion dollar company with, with a logistics and app uh, technology company. Um, but I mean, at the, at the end of the day, the amount of carbon emissions that a company like Uber is going to um, save is going to be monumental. Um, so it's thinking in, back to the, that definition of sustainability of people, planet, and profit. I'm um, figuring out ways to make a healthy profit, but also um, kind of making sure you're achieving success with giving people a, or serving some sort of demand for people, and then um, also addressing the planet. Uh, so recently, I was um, I was working as a fellow at the MIT Climate Collab, um, which is a part of the Center for uh, Collective Intelligence, um, and it was interesting that. The, the, the main mission of the Climate Collab is to crowdsource um, the next generation of um, kind of policies and technologies that are gonna, that are gonna solve um, or at least mitigate climate change um, and the, um, um, the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, and so it's really interesting to see that, you know, individually we um, you know, the, you can have a big company or you can have a uh, kind of a Batman character, um, so to speak, with extended metaphor. Um, but it's really going to take a valiant effort from all of us. So like individual actions, such as recycling, or, um, and it's really going to take a collective effort. And I think that's one the, the biggest take back I, I've had from um, working with the Climate Collab, um, is understanding that, um, you know, we're all one piece to this big puzzle. Um, we're all one kind of grain of sand, back to that, uh, the Bill Nye uh, metaphor. Um, so now I kind of want to go through a few really cool technologies and I'll kind of go through these pretty quickly um, and then talk about some things I've built myself. Um, so I'm sure you guys have all seen this before, uh, Nest thermostat. Um, so I mean, Nest is absolutely fascinating. I mean, it's taking together uh, like perfection, in, perfection in design, um, artificial intelligence, where it, it's learning your behavior and then reducing your energy consumption based on your behavior. Um, it's interacting with, with you um, with your mobile phone, and on top of that, it's saving you money at the end of the day because you're using less electricity. Um, so it's solutions like this, it's technologies like this, ideas and business models like this that are really going to kind of give an indirect solution towards sustainability and um, fighting climate change. Um, and then what's also really cool is things like uh, smart cities. Um, we've all heard about the Google self-driving cars. Um, you know, this new age of everything being connected to the internet um, and really, um, really like knowing the data and um, understanding the world around us. So the other day, one of my friends was showing me this article that I think believe somewhere in um, Australia, there, um, there was an experiment or something where they, they gave a tree an email address and then thousands of people were, were we're sending emails to these trees saying, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for, from mankind to you. Um, and I mean, it was mostly just funny stuff, but, you know, I turned back to my friend and said, you know, like, that's pretty cool, but, you know, what would be cool is that if that tree could respond to you, right? Br bringing together artificial intelligence and millions of years of evolutionary intelligence within the tree um, and have the tree respond to the human being saying, look, I need more water or, I mean, like how, how the soil is doing and so on and so forth. But what would be cool is if that tree responded um, to us as a society, so you're combining these, like, these new superpowers of artificial intelligence and uh, kind of this power of data and the Internet of Things, and then combining that with millions of years of evolution that the tree has gone through to, to be in the state that it is right now. Um, and so it's this, just this attitude of you know, pushing, the bear, pushing the boundaries of what we think is possible um, and what we think would be kind of cool. Um, so one really cool technology that I learned about recently um, was uh, graphene. Um, and so in the physics community, there's a kind of a joke that um, the Nobel Prize winner for graphene, it was the first Nobel Prize given for, um, for uh, experiment with scotch tape. Um, so literally it was uh, taking graphite and then uh, using scotch tape to peel off one layer. Um, and so graphene, for those who don't know, is uh, one atom thick um, carbon. Uh, carbon. Um, and so it, it's an amazing material where, um, if used properly, it um, has something like 200 times the strength of steel. Um, and it's uh, practically transparent. Um, it has so many applications, um, one of which is going to be huge in battery storage. I mean, there's experiments going on now to implement in lithium ion batteries. Um, and if you think about just like, like the, the absolute scale of like, technology like graphene can have, um, something that's stronger than steel, lighter than a feather, um, can, I mean, like, do extraordinary things to energy storage, the amount of electricity we use, um, 
And I mean, a, a, one of the huge, huge applications is in manufacturing. Um, that you know, we're, we're try constantly trying to figure out how to make our um, vehicles more, more efficient, how to uh, design our buildings in a more efficient manner. Um, and so, I mean, these kind of things like graphene and um, you know, other technologies out there that are kind of going to define this next generation um, and figuring out these direct and indirect ways to, uh, um, to tackle sustainability. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of some of my work when I was younger. Um, so keep in mind, this was a lot of stuff that I did when I was like 12 or 13. Um, so it was a learning process. It's still a learning process. So, um, so one of my first projects ever, I, um, you know, I, I was learning about photosynthesis in biology class. And you know, I learned a lot about how plants work and how, um, how you know, these plants, they take in carbon dioxide and sunlight, um, and then they expel oxygen, um, glucose for the, uh, or biomass for the, the plant. Um, you know, it was just like fascinating concept to learn as a, as a child. Um, but then I started to think that, you know, there's so many of these sources of carbon dioxide out there, whether it's through a coal factory, a power, uh, power plant, um, through the exhaust stream of a car. Um, but, you know, the main problem is that like, most of these plants are not going to survive in, in these extreme conditions. Um, and so I remember learning about things like um, natural selection, right? And then, and then what I thought was, as a kid, like, why can't I kind of speed up that process of natural selection? So uh, what I did was I went to a local aquarium, and um, I got a few strains of algae, and I started growing them at, at my lab in my school. Um, I started exposing them to high heat and high pressure, um, and basically doing artificial selection before I knew what artificial selection was. Um, and most of the strains would die off, and then I would grow, and then whichever strains lived, I would, I would, I would grow, um, uh, grow based on those, and then so on and so forth. Um, until you kind of have this super strain of, um, of algae. And I think what, what ended up happening was I, I was learning about these processes of chemistry and physics and um, kind of how the world works. Um, so I, when I was about 13 years old, I had this idea, which at the time was crazy. People st still think it's crazy, um, and people will always think it's crazy. But it was a device to reduce your carbon emissions uh, directly from your exhaust stream of a car. Um, and so this was the first prototype I built. I went to Radio Shack and Home Depot, um, picked up a, um, a fan, a motion sensor, um, battery, uh, little battery pack, uh, aluminum, aluminum alloy, um, and, uh, and, then I, and then I started kind of just engineering in my, uh, in my bedroom, at my lab, and like really trying to figure out, if, is there a way to reduce your carbon emissions from your car? Um, so over the years, kind of developed this technology. I, um, ended up patenting it, and uh, recently actually received the utility patent for it. But it, you know, it can be applied for anywhere from a small scale, from the exhaust stream up to a coal factory. Um, and what's really cool about it is that it's kind of using both biomimicry and this process of evolution and natural selection in the lab, artificial selection, and the combining it with principles of engineering and, um, and, uh, and fluid dynamics. I mean, there's so many different components to it. Um, and I mean, what 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 I think would be cool and is kind of the only pragmatic way to do this is to um, kind of have it a part of the vehicle so it's no additional weight to the vehicle, uh, which then forces you not to burn more fuel to get where you're going. Um, I recently read this article um, that, you know, there's this new wave of powering your electronics with uh, um, the biofuel from your body. Um, you know, when I was 14, I would tell my friends and professors and whatnot that, you know, like, we have all these electronics, why don't we use wasted energy from our body? Most people looked at me, um, and said I was crazy or naive. Um, but it was kind of funny to see the article a few years later that, uh, that went viral. But um, you know, there's like this big wave of wearable electronics. Um, and you know, if you think about it, there's so much energy that's lost from our human body. And I mean, the article went into so many things from wasted heat um, that we're expelling from our body um, to capturing energy from tears. Um, there's just so much cool stuff that's going on out there to um, kind of power the grid on these unconventional sources. Um, and so one of my ideas a couple of years ago, and I built a prototype for this, was um, basically the idea was originally to build a smartwatch that ran off of expelled heat from the human wrist. Um, at the time, I didn't know too much about, uh, um, too much about uh, kind of the Peltier effect or uh, kind of how to capture wasted heat. So I, you know, I went online and, sh and found out uh, these things called Peltier tiles, uh, which are just these little thermoelectric generators that you can order online for $5. And um, basically how it works is it's a proton gradient. And, uh, um, based on the temper temperature differential, you can, if, if you have a high enough temperature differential, you can uh, capture um, some power out of it. Um, and so, I mean, what's really, really cool about this is that, um, yes, it, at a small scale, it, uh, 
it wouldn't work on the human body. But you know, something like this applied to a coal factory where you know most of the heat losses are coming through the smokestack. Um, you know, and figuring out this 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 uh, perfection of the intersection between design, technology, and sustainability, where you know we use these principles uh, like the Peltier tiles that are already out there, figure out the per perfect design and 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 um, kind of figure out exactly where it would go. Um, and there's something beautiful to that. Um, uh, so last year I was uh, teaching, uh, this is the, the last piece of cool technology that I, I've said cool, I don't know how many times now. Um, and so, so last year I was, uh, um, I was teaching a class at the Nouveau Studio in Boston. Um, it's in association with MIT. Um, and I was explaining to them this concept of capturing wasted heat energy from, you know, from anywhere. Um, and one of the kids came up with this, uh, this device that it's a, uh, a computer sleeve for your MacBook, um, and it captures wasted heat from your um, from your laptop to not only keep your laptop cool but also uh, to charge a small electronic. Um, and so, I, like, it just got me thinking, and um, and it was fascinating that a kind of 12-year-old came up with this. Kind of reminded me of a uh, younger Parm, but um, it was fascinating that. Um, not only you're solving the problem of the computer overheating, but also at the same time you uh, don't have to plug in your um, your iPhone charger to to an outlet. Um, so you're so solving all these like different problems uh, with the same solution. And that kind of brings me to why I started Ecoviate. Um, as you can probably tell, I have all these different ideas. I think a lot of things are fascinating, and um, so I started Ecoviate when I was uh, 18 years old to kind of bring my ideas to life and. Um, create cool technologies, um, empower others to do the same, and then also have some fun on the way. Um, and so our, the first thing we launched was a uh, mobile app. Um, so it's called the Ecoviate app. And you know, what we were really trying to do with that was to learn about sustainability behavior. Um, over the years, what I realized was that you know, there's all these different technologies and sustainability and uh, I mean, just everywhere. And, um, and then there is purchasing behavior. So as humans, we, um, you know, we buy things for a certain reason. Um, but there's kind of this disconnect between the two where uh, we don't really understand yet you know, like what drives us to get up and go recycle other than just feeling good about yourself. Um, so the goal there, well, the goal with the app was really to, was to learn more about kind of our behavior, like what, what kind of design and technology would drive a positive change, um, which then can be applied to sustainability but also different, um, different causes. Um, but yeah, and then I don't know if there's any How I Met Your Mother fans in the in the audience, but uh, so our third mission at Ecovid is to have some fun in the process and kind of uh, empower and inspire the next generation of, uh, of leaders to get involved with sustainability and uh, kind of show them that um, you know, working uh, in a social enterprise, so a company that's focused on a social mission um, can be cool. Um, and this one's for the, the ladies in the audience, uh, Ryan Gosling fans. <laughs> So what does this all mean? I've kind of talked about all these random things, said a lot of jargon terms, said sustainability a lot, said cool a lot. But what does it all mean? Um, really to bring it all together, it, I mean, the next generation is going to be defined on whether we can solve these problems or not. Um, you know, we have all these superpowers. We have the ability to create and to empower. Um, and it's just absolutely powerful what we can do as human beings, like with our mind. Um, and we really have to figure out how we're going to apply this. Um, you know, are we, and the, what I keep saying is that, are we going to create the next Facebook for dogs, or are we actually going to use these powers for good? Um, and are we going to solve the, uh, the next generation of problems? Um, so I'll leave you with uh, a couple of quotes and then uh, tied back to superpowers. Um, one of my favorite quotes was by Albert Einstein. What he said was, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. Um, many of these problems with sustainability, carbon emissions, were created because we built technologies that were serving a um, humanistic demand. Um, so we wanted to make our life easier. We wanted to get from point A to B faster, and so on and so forth. Um, and solving these problems is, is going to take a different level of thinking. Um, not only thinking about um, you know, figuring out how to capitalize on our demands, but also figuring out how we can do good with the planet. Um, and so it's, it's just going to take a different way of thinking and a different way of applying what we've already built um, to not build the next really cool robot that walks around and kind of maybe cleans your floor, but to um, you know, attach that to a tree and apply the same technology to, uh, to grow trees in a more efficient way. Um, and one of my role models, Steve Jobs, um, one of his famous quotes was that the world around you was built by people that are no smarter than yourself. Um, and if you think about, think about that for a second, that I mean, most of, the, most of the people in this room are educators, that 
Um, you know, imagine if the next generation of uh, teenagers and uh, even younger than that, you know, they grow up thinking that, you know, they have the, the resources and the intellectual bandwidth to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, to be the next Steve Jobs, um, to really create the change they want to see and build the future. Um, imagine how kind of empowering that is for um, the kid that wants to get involved with science and technology but doesn't really know if he can have an impact. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of leave you with um, one last uh, kind of anecdote about, and uh, story on uh, superpowers. So one of my favorites, one of my favorite superheroes is Spider-Man, right? And um, the quote that keeps get, get, that keeps coming up in the movie is that with great power comes great responsibility. Um, you know, as humans, we you know we've created these like great great powers and these uh, superpowers, um, but now it's time to act responsibly and apply them in the right manner because um, we don't want to end up being our own kryptonite. Thank you. We're a little ahead of schedule, so we have five minutes for questions. If anyone has a question for prom right now, you, you get to go back up there with your superpowers. <laughs> so as a STEM uh, education dropout, but as a STEM education proponent, I'm curious to know what could have kept you in school? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, I hope my parents aren't watching this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I think more hands-on learning. Um, you know, when, when I went through high school and college, I was more reprimanded for um, thinking out of the box, kind of creating, building, um, spending more of my time programming. Um, I, I mean, the example I can give is, you know, I, I took a few computer programming classes, and um, I'm sorry for all the programmers and developers out there, but, you, you know, like in, in an academic setting, you learn, you learn the proper way to do it, but I mean, in the real world, you, that's usually not the way you're, you're going to do it. You're going to write it the most efficient way. Um, and so I, I refuse to turn it in in a less efficient manner. Um, so I mean, I think that everyone in this room, I mean, from the few conversations I've had so far, it seems to be on the right path of kind of hands-on, straight to the point. Um, kind of you learn these skills that are applicable for the real world, and then you get out there. Um, and so I, I, it's prob I, I think it's a kind of an engagement in the way we're teaching. I don't know if that answers the question. That's a great, that's okay. a great Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody? For this 21-year-old dropout? <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Yep. Um, you seem to have an interest in lots of different things and some big uh, visions and I'm wondering how you're going to focus on the things that you actually want to accomplish, so that which would probably require a lot of follow through. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so I think that's one advantage of being an entrepreneur and a serial entrepreneur. So I'm able to um, kind of work on one company um, and then take it to the next. Um, and so you know, I've had all these projects and filed for a few patents, and I'm able to kind of work on um, these things individually, but. Um, to kind of answer your question, it's, um, you know, when I'm focusing on the company, there's, we have our primary product and we're kind of figuring out um, the way to integrate these other products um, into the platform. Um, and so I've been with the company, I've been trying to figure out how to bring everything together. Um, so it's just the, one thing I realized was that um, innately I'm an inventor. So um, I enjoy building things, I enjoy kind of learning about the world around me, but the way to do that the most effectively and efficiently is through entrepreneurship. Um, and, and which also allows me the ability to work on one project after another. Yep. Coming. So how many projects do you have lined up? <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, probably a lot more than I should. Um, I, have, uh, I have my company, uh, which is focusing on um, a few different products, but all around the software. Um, and the software kind of lays the foundation for the rest of the company. Um, and, then, um, and then on the side, I kind of just build a lot of random things. Um, 
you know, if you check out my website, I, uh, I, I kind of keep it up to date with a lot of things I've been building and um, just a lot of cool hacks and projects that uh, kind of make my life easier. Just, I, I find it's cool. Um, you know, recently I, um, I mean, it's not the Christmas season, but um, I thought it'd be cool that every time I opened my door, to, I connected a motion sensor to an Arduino to my speakers and uh, um, Christmas lights. So every time I walk in the door now, it plays Frank Sinatra Christmas music for 15 seconds. Um, you know, it was a cool little project, but the point is that I just, I'm always thinking about these things and, um, and uh, the, uh, I guess the advantage with these superpowers is the rapid prototyping and uh, you're able to kind of build these things on the go. Um, you're being on the top end of the tech industry uh, tie-ins right now. Uh, straight out in front. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that we challenge, or uh, at the community college level, one of the things we struggle with as educators is trying to figure out what skills to teach our students. Can you give us the top three skills you want to see in uh, employees you would be interested in employing? Yeah, um, I, I think that's a multifaceted question, um, or it requires a multifaceted solution um, or answer. But um, I, I think in one regard, it first matters on what the, the student is striving to do. Um, and I, I don't think the average 18 to 24 year old knows exactly what they want to do with their life. Um, you know, I was privileged enough that when I was 11, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And so I was able to build this and learn the skills that I needed. Um, that being said, I mean, there are holistic skills that I think you can learn, and it's less on the specific skills and more on the way of thinking. Um, you know, the, these, like, next generation leaders are going to be, um, you know, very logical, kind of thinking about, you know, the three Ps, as I mentioned. Um, and like, I mean, there's things like programming and engineering that kind of teach you to think rationally, logically, think through things. And um, I think what's really missing, and this kind of ties back to your question, that I think what's really missing is rather than teaching very, very specific things, most of which end up being useless, it's uh, teaching them how to learn and um, how to grasp things on the go. Because, um, I mean, from my limited experience, my one year in the real world, it's really just, it's adapt or die. So you, you have to learn as fast as you can, and if you can't, then you get left behind, um, which is not something you kind of pick up in school. Yeah. But yeah, I'd love to talk to you more about it. It's, yeah, that's like the Spark Notes version. A simple yes or no answer, honestly. Are you a Linux user? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> we can talk more about that, too. <laughs> I just have uh, two things to say. One is <clears throat> it should scare everybody in this room that we couldn't keep them in school. And, and the second thing is, um, if the law of conservation of energy says that energy can't be created or destroyed, and we're fighting wars over energy, it seems like you may have some ideas on where that energy is going and how to get it back. Is that part of your research? Yeah, uh, so a lot of my projects have been on um, kind of uh, capturing wasted energy. Um, and so, I mean, I mean, like this, this goes back hundreds, I mean, probably at least 100 years of time of Nikola Tesla on um, this concept that, you know, like when you, tr when you transform energy from one, um, one type to another, there's going to be extreme loss. And then you have your maximum efficiency. Um, and then, I mean, you, you can do things to kind of get closer and closer to that uh, maximum efficiency. Um, and so I mean, that, that's been kind of a, a focal point of a lot of my research. And, uh, you know, when I was doing a lot of research with, um, electric vehicles, combustion engines, and what I re one thing I realized with just like being a human being that it got really hot when I was, you know, like uh, um, kind of laying down under the car and seeing what was going on. Um, and so, I mean, there's, there's just very simple ways, simple hacks out there to um, kind of capture those uh, w uh, wasted heat energy sources. Um, that being said, there's a still a lot of technology that needs to come out on kind of making these processes more efficient. I mean, these Peltier tiles, they, um, I mean, the, the tile itself has um, I think less than a 10 percent, less less than 10 percent efficiency with at least five degrees Celsius uh, temperature gradient, um, which pretty much makes it useless. Um, 
So I mean, it's, there's still a lot of technology that needs to kind of catch up to a lot of these ideas. Um, but a lot of these companies are figuring out now that you know there's a huge, huge market for this wasted energy. Um, I was just talking to Jamie down here about this company called Alphabet Energy. They they basically created a secondary um, secondary um, um, engine that attaches to the the stack on power plants, and it's um, they say it's the biggest thermoelectric generator in the world, um, where they're figuring out how to capture that wasted heat energy and then and then uh, um, transfer it back to the grid. Um, so I mean, yeah, there's just like a huge, huge opportunity here. Um, yeah. Final question right here. And I got a question for you, three other students in the front row, so be prepared. When you uh, were discussing biofuel, it made me wonder if you've done anything with cultured uh, mitochondria as far as the production of energy. Um, I haven't. I have, um, I've helped with a few projects. Um, not on mitochondria, but on uh, capturing, um, capturing energy between, uh, like in algae photosynthesis, um, between photosystem two and one on the electron tra transport chain. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there. But uh, um, so yeah, I've helped with kind of design on with some projects pertaining to that, um, but I've never done anything with that. But that being said, I'm always looking for new projects. Is there some promise in that area? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know enough about it, so. Um, I want to say yes, the inventor in me wants to say of course, but um, I don't know, I don't want to say something. Just, to, yeah. Yeah, uh, just quick, there's three other students in the front row that are from Connecticut. What is the priority in one sentence from a millennial and an education standpoint for you? Could you repeat that question? What is your priority from education? What are you looking to get out of your education in one sentence? Is it a job? Is it education? Is it advancement? What is missing in school, and what are you looking for in your school? One of the things that I think is missing in school is a lot of hands-on. Um, we really learn a lot of theory. In four-year universities, we actually only learn more theory, and we only get to actually touch something in our senior year. I find we should actually be able to actually put ourselves more out there so we can have much more experience as the world is advancing. Exactly. Yep. Um, in regards to what I feel is missing, would also be hands-on. Um, I was fortunate enough to kind of enter the workforce early, um, so that helped me kind of have a reference point for everything that I was learning, um, so I could apply the theory directly. Um, as far as what I want to get out of school is I want to take my education and try and help people less fortunate, um, and try and do my part to kind of help save the world. Just make something that makes an impact, I guess. Kind of it. It's funny, and I'll just add to that. If you ask me when I came out in 1995, I said, I want a job that pays the most money. Your generation actually says societal impact, and you see it in interviews all across the country. So it's great. It's beautiful. One other student. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, I guess I would just say the same thing that my teammates have said, is just to make an impact and change the world. And um, I heard someone made a comment that uh, educators had a hard time keeping a student like him in. Um, but if those schools don't offer those hands-on, there's always advisors who can reach out and find programs like mine has to get you involved and get the hands-on. So always can make those programs. Thank you, Prom, as well. Thank you very much. Turn it over to Chris. Thank you. and to make the world a better place. It was truly inspiring. Thank you. And thank you all for your time being here as attendees. Thank you presenters, committee members, hotel staff, everybody. This has been a wonderful, wonderful conference, and we are looking forward to seeing you in 2016. Don't forget, we have afternoon sessions. Please attend the afternoon sessions, and we'll see you next year in Pittsburgh.